On January 29th, uh, my hometown, Quebec City, was the theater of one of the most deadly terrorist attacks in the history of Canada. Uh, six men were killed in a mosque, and um, as somebody, a person of color who grew up there, we get to be shocked because it's human to be shocked, but we do not get to be surprised. Um, growing up in Quebec City is facing an environment of private radios where racial terrorism is a, non a norm and where it's okay to um, basically uh, target uh, women, poor people, people of color uh, daily. Basically what they do is that they build into their budget the lawsuits and the trouble of the CRTC. When the CRTC closed them down, they open up again on the web until the delay is over and they open up again. There's been a, a culture of violence in uh, the airwaves um, in Quebec City that has allowed for this to happen. There's been, of course, all the reasonable accommodation crisis that's been going on for 10 years in Quebec that has uh, constructed Muslim people as a social problem. You need to incorporate in the discussions of air pollution and their impact of, on health the idea that airwave pollution is also <laughs> something that we need to address in this country. Growing up in Quebec City as a black woman is also the idea that, especially when you're light-skinned and pass for Muslim, for many people, you're, although you are not, is the idea that when you work with the public, um, you get harassed. Um, when uh, I, had, I had my brother um, being told that um, it was basically not okay for him to date this person in his neighborhood because their parents wouldn't her parents wouldn't accept that um, that her that their daughter would be dating a black person. Um, it is having the idea with schools mail that uh, your hair or the, the, my hair as I wear them now would be just funny for a Halloween costume. Um, it is uh, your teacher telling you that it's surprising that Emily is the smartest person in the class, given that she's black. Um, it is the school curriculum just invisibilizing the history of your people. And it is also often, if you are out of cities like Toronto and Montreal, a lot of uh, social isolation. So with all of that background, at 19, I became an activist. And I started being involved in politics, trying to change the conversation about diversity and inclusion and racism uh, in Quebec and now more largely in Canada, because the idea is if you don't take care of politics, politics is taking care of you anyway. Um, at 28 now, I've, you know, you've, uh, André Pika just mentioned my bio. I'm finishing up my PhD in anthropology at the University of Toronto. I have a fancy Governor General Award. So by, by many, by, by many uh, standards, I cannot position myself as a victim at all. But in all of these years doing that work, um, I've also, uh, I'm, I also need to identify as a two-time survivor of depression and a two-time survivor of rape and sexual assault. And I want to say this because actually the statistics show in this country that one in four women approximately are survivors of rape. It's one in three in Quebec. But the data we have for the US, and I have no reason to think that it's better off in Canada, is that about 60% of black women are survivors of, sex, of sexual assault. And the data also show that um, if you're a straight woman, it's about 35% of women who are survivors. If you're a lesbian woman, it's about 44%. But if you are a bi woman like myself, it's about 60%. I'm not getting into trans people and what they have to face, right? And so if you're a black bi woman like myself, the odds of me standing in front of you not having this history of violence are very low. And we need to understand that when we hear politicians saying that Canada's diversity is our strength and we have this equality of opportunity in this country, we need to remind ourselves of this reality, because when we are cheerful and want to say that Canada is so awesome, what we are doing is erasing these stories and erasing the realities of so many people in our communities. What my experience have been as an activist is often just breaking 
the denial, the, the very specifically Canadian cycle of denial of the reality of racism. Um, denial of what's been going on in our schools. For example, in Montreal, you have this, this systemic um, diagnosis of children who ha don't have French as a first language have ha as having language disabilities. So what the teachers end up doing is recommending the children or recommending the parents to stop speaking their mother tongue at home. And usually what happens is that these children grow up and they have, they're completely disconnected from their heritage as a result of what the, t the school system has been telling them. And so you have cultural assimilation taking place in a way that's encouraged by our public government. You have, of course, higher rate of dropping out. You have higher rate of diagnosis with HDHD uh, for black communities, for example. And you have um, school orientators or I don't know, a school orient a professional orientation basically telling people from certain neighborhoods um, that they should uh, consider um, you know, professional, um, lower paying, less ambitious diplomas, um, that they're not good for university and that they should, they should be more humble in their ambitions is something that happens systemically in our schools. In our health system, you know, there's just been this campaign going on in Montreal North to have a proximity, cl a proximity clinic because usually what happens is that the health, um, the health, the healthcare system does not provide any culturally uh, adequate background for the pe for people in this neighborhood who are usually a lot a lot of them are Haitian. Um, it was just in the news today that uh, indigenous activists in Montreal have been fighting for eight years, eight years to have a health care clinic in downtown Montreal that would address the specific issues of indigenous people. And it's still not done and the mayor, is, and the mayor of Montreal is still delaying the meeting so that it can get done. Um, you have, of course, often an epidemic of mental health issues in our, in our communities. And this is overly underdiagnosed because there's this, this internalized um, image of the strong black woman or often even culturally the idea that mental illness is for white people that we have in our communities and we need to unpack this and where this comes from in terms of the history of coming starting from slavery to this day of where, where, where these ideas that uh, the way that culturally people express their illnesses is often not even recognized by, by practitioners who don't have the training um, to recognize what's been going on. Um, in terms of in terms of women's health, um, it's been, you know, it's been it's been a struggle for many people in the, in the black communities in Montreal to find practitioners that are sensitive to their specific reality. Usually, what happens is that uh, you have grassroots activists who start building up their own list of people that they can trust, so that people know where to navigate the system. Um, because when it comes to even just going to the police to report some sort of violence or ab and abuse, usually what happens is that, well, some of you have heard, you know, the Valdor, the, the Valdor scandal where, you know, police were actually the one doing the raping of indigenous women. Perhaps what you haven't heard as well is that um, there's a lot of police officers working in Haiti and a lot of them with the UN mission and a lot of them have been, have been accused of sexual assault on Haitian women as well in Haiti our Canadian police officers. So the, so the situation of distrust makes it very hard to go into certain communities or for some certain communities to have some level of trust in the institutions that we have. And so, and yes, I need to mention as well social services. You know, the gross over-representation of black and indigenous, and indigenous people in children that are put up to adoption or is put up to foster care and how that contributes to, to a cycle of cultural assimilation that is not in the past but very present today in the way that social services ex uh, operate in this country. So all of these aspects contribute to an epidemic of low self-esteem, low self stress and anxiety in our communities. And these lead to other health problems in terms of if people don't love themselves, they don't care, they don't take care of themselves, they don't eat properly. And this leads to other, uh, another set, a uh, different set of physical problems that people don't link uh, to the systemic issues that our communities are facing. Um, a lot of the time when I go on television or on the radio to try to address systemic racism in Canada and anti-black racism in Canada, 
usually what happens is that um, the journalists or people tell me about, yeah, but it's not as bad as, as the United States. That's the usual answer that I get from people who have two things in common. They've never lived in the United States and they are not black. <laughs> when you go and do interviews and trying to support, you know, movements like Black Lives Matter, um, you end up leaving the CBC Tower feeling like you have bruises all over your body just because of the microaggressions that come from journalists. And um, often the way that these aggressions take place is that they tell you that you don't know what you're talking about because you don't have the data. And one thing that I've purposely done in this presentation is to not be too aggressive on the graphs and the numbers. Because one of the ways that racism works in this country is that we refuse to collect the data. We just don't collect them. We don't break down what's been going on with black communities. We put it in terms of like visible minorities if we do it at all. And so usually what happens is that um, we are unable to prove in a scientific, you know, objective, eco economist-centered language what's been going on and what we all know in our communities. So the first thing that I'd like all of you to change, perhaps, is to not wait for the numbers for you to start believing. Because if you do that, you are part of the problems. Um, the other thing as well is for you to push for us to collect the goddamn data, <laughs> right? And to, do, and to do the research. But actually, no, just don't necessarily do the research yourself. You know, have the communities inform the research agenda and make sure that you have people of color in our universities doing the research so that we all not only get to be data or storytellers, but we also get to be experts of our own stories. That in Canada would be revolutionary. What needs to happen is that we need to build our communities, we need to build our schools, uh, we need to build uh, healing spaces, and we need to understand that the solution to you know, the impact of systemic racism on our health is not necessarily going to look like um, traditional, me traditional medicine. Um, I could give you solutions that look like diversify health staff, um, have more of a training of how history functions and how society function in our medicine school. Um, collect data, of course, and break them down. And of course, as well, break them down in a way that acknowledge intersectionality, which is don't do just research on women and then you do research on black people and then black women are, no, are, are nowhere. Just do, do it all at the same time. Break, them, break the, data, the data down sorry, in a way that's intelligent. Um, but, you know, it's also just about not harming us at the first place. So we don't need to do all of that healing afterwards. Um, Post-traumatic slave syndrome or, you know, these other words that a psychiatrist like Franz Fanon would have come up with are not going to be healed by a pill. They're going to be healed by decolonization. And that's a much bigger harder task for us to take on. But it's the only, the only way forward. Um, if we can stop, you know, killing us, <laughs> if, we can, if we can stop harming us, if we can stop destroying our lands, um, both here but also in, Ca in, in Africa and in, in the Caribbean, because people from that, with diasporic identity were all interlinked, and what goes on in Africa and in the Caribbean impacts people in Canada. We, we need to stop having these narrow models of you know, looking at one nation as if the rest was outside of it, especially for people with diasporic identi uh, identities. This way of looking at things doesn't really make sense in terms of how we're impacted by what goes on internationally. Um, you need to we need to stop destroying our, our pride and our self-worth and our ambition and our languages and our communities and our identities and our families and our credibilities. And you need to believe what we say and to listen to the stories that are already out, out there. A lot of the times, people who have the knowledge don't have the authority for them to be considered as convincing in spaces like this. And usually what happens is that the research that is being done is about putting in a, 
putting things that people already know in a vocabulary that will sound serious. But that does not lead to new knowledge that can actually inform the communities as to what they need to know, right? So the, the, the knowledge, the, the, the scientific agenda is often more often um, what uh, the majority needs to learn than about what, what is the knowledge that communities need to learn to be able to uplift themselves. And so as long as we can change that around and change who has the power over creating knowledge, there's a lot that can happen. Um, we need to break the silence, um, but we also need to amplify that, acknowledge that people have been breaking the silence for a long time, but they just haven't been listened. Um, and we need to act. At this point, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Report is already out there. You have these 90 call to, uh, there's 94 call to actions. A lot of them haven't been responded to, and it's not just the government. It's all the professional bodies, and it's all the civic, civil society organizations, and it's all of us as citizens that, that could take on more. Um, there's, as well, as I said, a lack of knowledge and documentation and, and research. Um, and it's very unequal depending on the province you're in. Um, as in Quebec, um, with others, I've been with a, for a full year now uh, building this campaign to call for the Quebec government to do a commission into systemic racism. And what we've done is to build a coalition of about 85 organizations pushing for this, pushing to have more knowledge and pushing to, uh, for citizens who are usually at the margin of the political system, to be able to have a say and um, have their voice heard just by itself, that is a healing process because it says that your voice is important and it's not just university uh, professors who can speak on your behalf. Um, in Canada, there's a lot more that could be done as well at the federal level. Um, we're undertaking a review of what multiculturalism means. Uh, it's been changed from the Minister of Immigration to the Minister of Heritage. Um, multiculturalism in, in this country has been built in an era where it was mostly um, about um, European minorities in the sense that they're the ones who lobbied for biculturalism to become multiculturalism the most powerfully. Uh, Canada had just opened widely his, his, uh, their, their borders to, to immigration of color at the time where multiculturalism was discussed. So we need to understand that multiculturalism does not address race and racism enough, partly by design. And so we need to address that. We need to stop being able to point out to multiculturalism as a way to erase the, the issues of racism in this country. And there's a, an opportunity now with Canada 150 and with this review of multiculturalism policy to review that. There's an opportunity as well to be looking at what criminal justice reform could look like. There's an opportunity for a lot of things, but the one thing that stops us usually from getting together and be able to do this work is A, denial, and B, communities of color um, being separated, not knowing each other's reality because we don't teach it in our schools. Uh, we don't know our own history ourselves. Um, and we are, we're not often uh, as connected as we should to each other. And so um, I've been very encouraged by what's been going on um, at the Brabant Institute, for example, in the last couple of days. We had people coming from all over the countries discussing these issues and coming together and starting to build networks. But as long as we start doing that, and as long as we stop the inaction, and as long as we start believing and um, start um, acting, um, a lot, a lot is possible in this country. So um, thank you, and I hope we'll have a meaningful uh, question period.